Good morning, party people, and welcome to another episode of Office Hours. I am coming to you from Camden, Maine. Cute little harbor here. Uh, just missed a boat going out to do lobster fishing here today. Uh, very pretty. It's the fall. It's the end of the season. A little bit of an overcast morning, but it uh, promises to shape up to be pretty nice today. I'm not doing anything today. I'm not doing anything at all. I'm going to sit from a nice comfortable chair up in my hotel room, have a little hotel room overlooking the water. I'm going to sit and probably drink rum and watch the, the harbor all day and just totally recuperate from after several days of partying over in Salem. In the meantime, oh, it's gonna ring eight times. There's the, the city church bell. In the meantime, we're gonna do a speed round of office hours questions. First up, Alma asks, does index fragmentation matter with column store indexes on SQL Server with NVMe storage? Yes, fragmentation on column store is totally different. To learn more about that, watch my class, Fundamentals of Column Store, which happens to be on sale in November for Black Friday. Next up, Miss Minutes asks, what is your recommended way to find the slowest queries with plan warnings? SP Blitz Cache. It's an open source script. It's part of our first responder kit. Um, and I don't go looking for plan warnings specifically. I go looking for what are the most resource intensive queries. And then in the warnings column, there's a label for plan warnings. Some of those queries, <coughs> excuse me. Some of those queries are gonna have plan warnings some of them will not your job is to fix them regardless so focus on that first next up renzi asks what is your opinion of using azure managed disks versus azure storage accounts for azure sql vms to find out it's a little beyond what i can answer quickly check out my class running sql server in azure and amazon it's a, one of my online classes where i go into all kinds of details how you configure a vm how you configure storage and much more Next up we have Beta Ray asks, what are your thoughts on enabling lock pages in memory for Azure SQL VM? For anything, not just Azure SQL VMs, but for anything, as long as SQL Server is the only thing installed on that box, I love lock pages in memory. As soon as you uninstall anything else, I hate it. And I can't tell you how many people remote desktop into their SQL servers and run stuff. FileZilla, Chrome, Management Studio, all kinds of apps that have never been particularly known for their low memory usage, and then they're surprised when they run into performance problems. Next up, Cheech asks, what is your opinion of SP Invoke REST Endpoint, in Invoke External REST Endpoint, for invoking REST Endpoints from the SQL Server? Have you seen any good use cases? I've seen a ton, but it isn't there yet. That's the problem. It only exists in Azure SQL DB. I am looking forward to it existing in regular SQL Server. But for now, most of the Azure SQL DBs that I see, and remember, this is Azure SQL DB, it's not VMs. Now, Azure SQL DBs tend to be underpowered, so they run into all kinds of performance issues when you start piling on, hey, let's go call a web service, so it tends to be kind of bad. But I, I have a lot of good use cases for it, and as soon as it's available in the box product, I'll talk more about those. Next up, Franz asks, does SQL Server have anything comparable to Postgres plugins? No, that's my answer. Someone out there in the comments is going to say, Brant, you can build CLR DLLs and put them in with SQL Server. Yes, but whenever I've seen that done, the people who've done it haven't been good at memory troubleshooting, and they've been surprised when that CLR DLL sucks up more and more memory over time, and next thing you know, they have a serious memory problem on the production SQL Server. Also, with CLR DLLs, there's not really an established marketplace for it like there is with Postgres extensions. With Postgres extensions, they're common. You can find directories full of them. Uh, I'm not saying that you should go wild and crazy with installing them, but that's the difference between the two. Next up, Izzy asks, why does SQL Server Management Studio default identity seed values to one instead of the smallest negative values? Should this be changed? For why questions, you'll have to talk with Microsoft. But the one thing that I would say in terms of why questions is, 
Microsoft wants to give you something that's easy to understand. And if you gave someone an identity st that started at negative two billion and suddenly started co coming upwards, people might kind of freak out about that. Especially because people tend to use those IDs for customer facing purposes like invoice ID. Imagine that you showed someone, hi, here's your invoice, negative 4,323,000 people will be like, ah, oh, you have a bug in your system. So that's probably why. Next up, Alma asks, what is your opinion of vector databases? I have no opinion whatsoever. I haven't uh, in, gotten involved with them. The only reason I'm even answering this question is it was very highly voted. No absolute clue. Miss Minutes asks, for performance reasons, is it ever wise or permissible to have a unique non-clustered index instead of a primary key? Yes, and here's the situation. Okay. Here's the situation. Your parents went away for a week's vacation and they left the keys to the brand new Porsche and they mined. Mm, well, of course not. I could go on through that entire song and it's been probably a decade since I heard it, but there you go. There's that earworm. Um, is it ever wise or permissible? The, the general reason why is somebody built a heap and they put a primary key on that heap, but it wasn't clustered. And then when you inherited it and you had to go back and fix it, you didn't want to drop the primary key because you would have had to drop all the relationships between the tables to redo that key to make it clustered. So what people will do is they'll put a unique non-clustered index on that uh, column that's the same as the ID, and they'll have one unique non-clustered, I'm sorry, one unique clustered index uh, on that column plus a primary key on that same column, which is effectively two indexes on it. But they'll do that rather than tear down replication which can or not replication the, the primary keys in a perfect world they'd redo all the primary keys in the database but you can guess why that's a hot mess since it's transactionally logged it would be a blowout to the log file it would blow out all your log shipping database mirroring rep are always on availability groups you're probably looking at changes to replication configuration all kinds of stuff Next up, Sean asks, what is your favorite VM size or SKU for running Azure SQL VMs with a good balance of price to performance? Sean, check out my class, Running SQL Server in Azure and Amazon. It's available this month on sale during my Black Friday sale. Enjoy. Next up, Eric Wright asks, what is your opinion of using third-party SQL backup software to support restoring individual tables in the event of oopsies? I love it. I'm a huge fan of it, and I've even got one of the top-rated uh, feedback.azure.com requests to have SQL Server support that natively inside their own backups. I wish that I didn't need third-party backup apps to do it, but that's the reality, unfortunately, today. And of course, it only gets worse in things like Azure, SQL DB, and managed instances, where a restore often involves restoring a whole bunch of data that you don't care about with a really long service level agreement. There's no SLA for how long a restore can take. So you can be down for hours or I've even seen a day with a really large database restore with heavy transactional activity uh, in order to pull a restore back. Then you even have to start moving the table across, which takes even longer time. Next up, Azure Data asks, large company looking to standardize Azure SQL DB deployments. What are the pros and cons of keeping everything under a single resource group that the DBAs own or manage versus letting the developers provision their own databases in their own RG? Is it bad to have one massive resource group for SQL DBs if it's locked down? Generally, companies are going to, or I don't want to say generally companies are going. The companies who go to Azure SQL DB are trying to do that for easier, simpler management. They don't want to have a whole bunch of staff in the way that don't particularly add value. Generally speaking, production DBAs don't add a lot of value to Azure SQL DB deployments. They only add latency, like slowdowns and permissions in between teams. So I'm not a fan of having the DBAs control Azure SQL DBs. I'm a much bigger fan of having the developers control those and making them part of things like scripted uh, deployments uh, so that they can quickly deploy stuff in different regions. They, there's no need to wait for the DBAs for that. If you just said managed instances, I would have felt differently, but for Azure SQL DBs, not nah, get out of the way. 
Uh, next up, WTF asks, Azure SQL DB's TempDB size is governed by CPU count of the instance. My data science team is constantly running out of TempDB space. I've increased CPU a few times since now it's getting more expensive. Do you have suggestions for reducing TempDB usage? Okay, so usually data science teams aren't connecting to an individual Azure SQL DB. Azure SQL DB just only scales so high in terms of performance throughput, massive loadability for speed. Generally, I see data analysts connected to things that are more scalable, things like either managed instances, if you were in Azure, you could do hyperscale or VMs. Um, but generally, I don't see that as an issue because I don't generally see people running out of control queries against Azure SQL DB. That's not its strong point and you're learning that. So the question that I would turn around and ask the company is, why are we using Azure SQL DB for something that the data science team is connecting to? There's probably something else that's a better fit. This right here would be where I would plug my running SQL Server in Azure and Amazon class, but I think I've already done that twice in this webcast, so I should probably stop. Mike asks, how can you efficiently delete records from very large tables? I have tables that I store log data in and I need to purge them occasionally. Truncate isn't an option because I want to keep the most recent. I have read that deleting batches is an option. It is. And if you want the answer to this question, Google for Brent Ozar how to delete just some records from a very large table. And I have a blog post out on there with a, uh, example code, explanations of why it works the way it does. I'm gonna give a really weird answer here. Anytime that you have a question, Google for my, a SQL Server question or Azure SQL DB question, Google for my name and the question, and you wouldn't believe the number of times that I have a blog post. And I don't usually give that answer in on camera because I almost feel like it's cheating, but you'd be able to solve your questions a whole lot faster, which is kind of cool. Balin asks, is Postgres uh, DBA and consulting as lucrative as SQL Server DBA and consulting? I have no idea because I don't do Postgres consulting or database administration work. The thing that I would say is the cheaper that software is, the more expensive you look in comparison. So if you want to make the most money possible, you probably don't want to work on something that's free. There are very highly, pay, highly paid jobs out there for people who do MySQL and Postgres, but there aren't that many of them whereas it's fairly normal to find them as software gets more expensive. Uh, and then we'll do one more. Let's see here. Uh, should I specialize asks, Brent, I'd like to hear your take on the generalist versus specialist discussion. I'm an application developer. I'm curious about databases and performance tuning, and I have a hard time choosing a niche. The, the place where I heard this from, it's not his original advice and he says that, but the place where I heard it from was Buck Woody. Buck Woody works for Microsoft. If you ever get the chance to see him speak, he's absolutely fantastic. I'll always listen to anything that Buck wants to talk about. has so many great stories. One of the th his advice on here is, in an immature market, be a generalist. In a mature market, be a specialist. Here's what that means. SQL Server is a very mature market. It's been around for over 20 years. The documentation is fairly straightforward. It's a, there, there are tons of established tools around it. It's a very mature tool. It pays more to be a deep diving specialist there to solve very specific problems because there's a huge market penetration for SQL Server. It's very easy to find clients who need to solve that one specific problem. An immature market might be something like AI. AI is a great example of an immature market. 
if you want to uh, get a job in AI, you're going to have to be a generalist. You're going to have to know all kinds of tools and how to glue them together because the state, on the art, state of the art in tools is constantly changing. There are constantly different tools that pop up uh, from the course of like every three months. The tools that you're using can look completely different. So that's a market where you have to be a generalist if you're going to succeed, because if you specialize in just one tool, that tool could be out of fashion in six months from now and you'd be out of a job. All right, there we go. There's a good round of speed round questions for this episode of Office Hours. Now as the sun starts to rise and I hear another boat's uh, diesel engines popping up out there, as the sun starts to rise, I'm going to go uh, relax in my hotel room, go uh, make myself a nice Irish coffee and sit and watch the sun continuously bake the uh, clouds off and have a good old time. See you next time on Office Hours. Adios.